spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Please pray with me. God of love and grace, we gather together to worship you, to offer you our thanks and praise, and to proclaim your goodness and mercy. Meet us here. Breathe your word into our souls. Engrave your covenant of love upon our hearts. Teach us faithfulness and compassion so that our lives may reflect your great love and light to the world. Amen. God invites us to worship him today before his throne of grace. So please stand and sing with us. Shout Hosanna, followed by Made for Worship.
comes to his house of worship this morning with words from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? As God welcomes us to his house this morning, please take a moment to welcome and greet those around you. Dear Father, we come humbly before you today to ask that you help us lay down our worries and our stresses at your feet. We are often selfish, and we put our desires before the needs of others. 
we fail to put you above all and our neighbors as ourselves. Please forgive us and help us to seek you and your great light, for you are so good and faithful. In spite of our selfishness, you continue to put us first. You alone are worthy of our praise, O oh God. In your great and most holy name, amen. Last week we prayed for the two women who had surgery, and guess what? The Lord answered our prayers and they were healed. Wonderful the way the Lord works. And of course, we had 150 plus kids here in Bible school, rambunctious but having a lot of fun, and a great opportunity for 80 of our people to be involved as volunteers in that. But you know what we want most of all? Not that those boys and girls had a great time at Bible school, that those boys and girls come to know Jesus Christ as their very best friend, as their savior, looking up to the cross, and as Lord of their life. And we pray that each boy and girl here in the sanctuary has that experience too. And we look forward to the time when you boys and girls and teenagers stand up here where I am 
and commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I want to belong to him. That's Bible school is just a single step in that great process of coming forward. And now I know a lot of people are kind of say, I wonder why God would have a child born with Down syndrome and then strike that child with cancer two years later. But those of you following Knox's Caring Bridge know why God does that. Because it's such an inspiration. So good to see the faith of father and mother. So good to see a child who's loved and embraced by hospital staff, and by parents, and by us who pray for Noxy. We also are thankful that our congregation has the opportunity on the 15th of July, long ways off, to serve at the banquet. We want to remember that in prayer as well. But also, I was struck yesterday uh, by that long story in the Argus Leader uh, about how our school stayed open. And of course, really, what they were talking about in general was how we responded to this crisis of the pandemic. But what it struck me especially uh, was that they pointed out that Jay Wildstra had consulted with 40 other Christian school principals. And so they were able to develop a model in which we could have class go on and school go on in a wonderful way. And we're thankful for the leadership in the public schools, uh, the paper two accredited parents and said we have a supportive parent community here. And we're thankful for the Catholic schools, the other Luke Christian schools in town. And we pray that that nurture of our children will make them the strongest generation there's ever been for Jesus. And maybe they'll need it because maybe, just maybe, we're entering the last time. Those are some of the things that we're going to pray for this morning. And so will you join me as we come to God in prayer? Father in heaven, you are so marvelous and so powerful. Your glory extends beyond the universe. There's no way that we can contain you or grasp you or understand you. You alone have the words of eternal life. You alone have eternal life. You alone can grant salvation. And so we thank you for the marvelous creation you made. We see just a smidgen of its beauty here in South Dakota when there's so much more of a planet. And that our planet is such a very small part of the great universe that you created and are still expanding at a tremendous rate of the speed of light. Lord, when we think of those things, we think of who you are, and we give you our tremendous praise for your creation and for your salvation, for the abundant life now, for eternal life to come. You heard our prayers of last week, and now two of our members had successful surgery. No surprise to us, because you're a God who answers prayer in marvelous ways. We're thankful too, Father in heaven, for the privilege that we have as a church family uh, to reach out to those in need, serving at the banquet on July 15. And we can put it on our calendars and kind of remember it as a time when we're going to step forward and make ourselves appreciated. We also want to thank you so much for the Bible school that was held this week. We ask, Father in heaven, that the boys and girls who attended and several of them at the morning service here, the early morning service, said how happy they were to be at Bible school. What a joy. And we're just waiting for the Holy Spirit to continue to work in their lives. So they come to the ears of determination and discretion and they stand here and commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And we know it's because you first committed your life to them. Thank you so much for each boy and girl here in the sanctuary this morning. We pray that you nurture them. May the message of this morning 
and may the testimony of their parents and may their education that they have, regardless of what school they attend, nurture and bless them so they grow up to be stalwart sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Father in heaven, we also come to you today because we know that the struggle with Naxivan ruler is so difficult for Aaron and Sadie. And yet, they are giving a shining testimony in their Caringbridge page. And we know that there's congregations who support their family around the country who are all praying because of Noxie. And so we understand a little bit why you send somebody into the world who's not able to function all that well, who's stricken by illness and disease, and we see ourselves. We don't always function so well either. And we don't always do our best in the world either. And so we thank you that those physical disabilities of Noxie lead to such spiritual energy and spiritual vitality. And we praise you for the grace you're giving to Aaron and Sadie, to the skill of the Caring Bridge page, for the inspiration that the Holy Spirit is bringing through this life. Thank you, Jesus. And we also thank you for the privilege we have of living in the city of Sioux Falls, we're thankful, Father in heaven, for the blessings that you've poured upon us. We see construction all around us. The buildings are going up. People are coming to our town for opportunities to work and to live. And we pray that we may be a people who put Jesus Christ first, that the churches of this community will be churches that proclaim the true gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified is the only way of salvation. Our faith, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the only avenue to heaven. Father, as we look at the next generation being educated in our schools, whether in our public schools, our Catholic schools, private schools, Sioux Falls Christian School, wherever that may be, that you are raising up a great generation of young people, young people who can make a difference for Jesus in this world. We pray that they may be the greatest generation that you've ever raised up, because we know that if we're approaching the last days, they're going to need it. Because your own son said that if the days weren't shortened, even the elect wouldn't endure, and we know that your church will be standing when Jesus comes again. And so we ask, Father in heaven, for your continued blessing on Sioux Falls Christian School, for the leadership provided by Jay Woudstra, and the collaboration he's making with many others. We thank you for our other Christian schools and Catholic schools, and we thank you for the many Christian teachers making a profound difference in our public schools here in Sioux Falls. Lord, you're raising up a new generation, and you're doing it full of zeal and hope at a wonderful time in our culture when there's so many challenges, but also so much certainty that you are King of kings and Lord of lords that this world belongs to you and this city belongs to you and help us to make it a reality in the way we live and worship and work. We give you our praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's our offering time. And you see on the screen the ways in which you can give your offering now. I wonder if we'll ever pass offering plates again. In fact, I was looking over at these here at the, between the services, and I thought, my, I wonder if COVID made these things obsolete. So 
Thank you, though, for your generous giving, because I hear your giving is up. And in some of these churches that I've been serving as interim pastor, they have never had higher contributions than now. In fact, some of them say, we were never richer. And I thought, well, they could pay me more, but <laughs> no, I'm glad that they're doing so well. The balance sheet is doing really good for some of them. So we just really praise God for that. So this giving is a wonderful thing. And since we're uh, focusing on our offering, right now let's uh, continue to praise God as we sing and the praise team will lead us. The words will be on the screen. So let's rise together. seated. I'm sure everyone here is aware of the way our culture is collapsing, our Christian history is being canceled, uh, our pilgrim forefathers are no longer taught, they don't talk about uh, great awakening and so it's, it's kind of a bad time to live. And so what happens is a lot of people ask me what can we do? I mean, it's just like me and my church. I mean, can we do anything to change the culture in which we live? Can we be a witness for them? Well, what can we do? Well, you know that for us as Reformed Christians, uh, that's kind of a powerful thing. Because as Reformed Christians, we always believe that we should be doing something. Our evangelical brothers kind of have a little different history and a little different slant. And they kind of talk about, yeah, when we all get to heaven. You know, and so if you kind of think about songs that we sing, uh, they say, uh, we're just passing through and we're just putting everything behind us and 
we're focusing on heaven, and we know that things are just not going to be so good in this home. And so we can say, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. That is true. But as Reformed Christians, uh, we're more thinking about work, for the night is coming under the sunset skies. Boy, it's almost too late to get the job done. So we really got to get out there and hustle. And so there's sort of a different slant that often in the evangelical circles, there's a lot of messages about the rapture. You know, that's the biggie. Because, yeah, well, this isn't my home. My, my home's on the other side of the rapture. And for us, we think, yeah, what could I do to be an influence in the culture in which I live? This world belongs to God. And how could I really make that a reality in this community of Sioux Falls? And so the question comes, how can we correct our culture? And actually, 2 Timothy 3 provides the perfect answer. And we're going to look at the five steps that 2 Timothy 3 sets out. And then we're also going to look at a disclaimer at the end because there are certain things that, well, we can't change. So let's take a look at 2 Timothy 3. I think the words will be on the screen. I'm reading it here from the same version of the Bible. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are like the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janice and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of these men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from the infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's a familiar chapter to you, I'm sure, and there's certain verses there that have been an important part of your spiritual walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we embrace them too today. So, friends in the Lord Jesus Christ, I've heard a lot of sermons about how bad the world is, and I've heard a lot of descriptions of how awful it is to be living in this world. Maybe you've heard them too. But I kind of think we ought to structure our life the way the Heidelberg Catechism does. We don't have to talk a lot about sin because we all know it. And we all know the sin in our own lives. But what we need to do is talk about what's my Christian responsibility in the culture that God's placed me. 
What does God expect of me, and what am I to do uh, to make the world in which I live a better place to be and a better place to live? And that's really the importance of what we have when we come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We all know what sin is. We all know that our culture is sinful. When we lived in Nigeria, the Nigerians said to us, you know, we can't figure it out. We are Christians today because you sent missionaries. And we always look to the United States of America as a place where it must be really godly because those missionaries came and brought us to know the Lord. But what do we hear now? Abortion. Misuse of God's gift of sexuality. People chasing after goods rather than God. Living in a world where materialism and consumerism are the number one things. The Muslim countries look at us, and what do they say? The United States is the great Satan. Well, how much abortion is there in Muslim countries? Or how much homosexuality? Or how much greediness? You gotta admit that if you look at the United States of America, you look at our own city, perhaps, we have to admit we are a lot like the great Satan that we're accused to be. So really for us, it's not how bad are things, but what can we do? And the first thing that the Bible talks about is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Jesus goes on in the Sermon on the Mount to the very next verse. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And then he goes on again in Matthew 13, 33. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a woman took out and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. And so the challenge of us is to be salt and light and yeast. And that's nothing new. You've heard that time and time again. Depends how old you are, how many times you've heard it. But I know that even boys and girls know that we're called to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, that we're to be yeast in our culture and just thriving Christianity through it. But the question comes, how are we going to do it? And this chapter of 2 Timothy gives us five steps. And we're going to go through those five steps. And then, of course, there'll be a disclaimer at the end those five steps, and we're actually going to start with, uh, well, I, they're not all difference of importance, but anyway, we're going to do it in an order that's reverse of the real power that they have. So let's look at the first one, which is really number five. Be aware to act. Now, the translators have trouble knowing just how this verse is supposed to begin. Uh, in the latest version that's being used in evangelical churches, it says, but understand this. If we go to the King James, uh, pardon me, if we go to the NIV that we read here this morning, we have, but mark this. But the King James Version has, but know this. And so what, the, what is it that we're to know? We get to know our culture. What is it really like? Understanding the city in which we live, the community of which we're a part. 
We kind of reflect on the fact that we uh, many times in our lives come and don't fully understand the situations that come in our lives. And we're struggling to know exactly how our community should respond to that. And so that's the thing that we really are trying to do. We need the knowledge to respond. Instead of wringing our hands and saying, oh, what a terrible world. Oh, this is wrong, and that's wrong, and the other thing's wrong. Instead of doing that, we are, what the message says, not naive. Don't be naive. Just face it. Just accept the fact that we have a real challenge and that real challenge can be met if we think about how we are to act, how we are to step forward in faith and use that salt and light and leaven to make a difference in the culture in which we live. Well, number four, learn God's word. Wow, that's really important. In fact, if we face the world and we understand it completely, but we don't understand what's in the Bible, then we're in real trouble. And the problem is that so often the Bible today is not really accepted for what it is. And so we have this powerful verses that come to us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so you would say, wow, that's simple. All we got to do is believe every word in this book. And you're right, because that is the simple truth and the simple gospel that God has given us all the words we need to live the Christian life. We know that the Bible has the way and the truth and the life right here. But you know what happens? We look around at our culture and it contradicts what's in the Bible. And then we start to make excuses. And we say, well, you know, that probably was a good teaching back in Paul's day but you know, that was the Roman world and we're in the American world. And so that verse of the Bible, well, it probably doesn't apply to us. So we can just forget about that teaching of the Bible. Unfortunately, that's what we do quite often. In the history of our own denomination, in the history of the denominations around us, over the last 40 years, we've been making those kind of choices. We look at what our culture says and we say, we're gonna do it. We don't wanna get so far out that we're kind of like the Amish and nobody respects us and says they're just kind of a cult. And so to keep up with the times, we gotta go along with the culture, even when it contradicts what the Bible says. And so the church loses its power. We no longer have this inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God guiding us over every decision that we make, over every understanding of our culture, how we need to react and act in the world in which we live. And so what we need to do is we need to reclaim what the Bible really is that the Bible is above culture, that the Bible is above everything else, that the only thing that matters in our life finally is what we do with this inerrant, infallible, authoritative word. And that's exactly what Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said to Timothy, all scripture is God breathed. It is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is the good work that he's going to do in the analysis of the culture in which he's living. 
Well, let's look at number three. We went too far. Gather like-minded people. Now, that's exactly why Paul is writing to Timothy. Because you see, Timothy was sent to Ephesus, one of the more sinful cities of the Roman Empire, and he was at planted a church there. Well, he wrote a first letter to Timothy, and Timothy, uh, he realized that it's not going so well. You know, it's difficult enough to plant churches in the United States of America. So you can imagine how difficult it was when churches weren't well known and there were hardly any in the world. And here's Timothy, and he's in this sinful city of Ephesus. He's not making much progress. So Paul writes to him again. And Paul says to him, you've got to gather like-minded people to yourself. You need to get those people together. And that's exactly what the Greek word from which we get the word church means. Ecclesia is the word, and we still use ecclesiastical, it's a long big word for church things. Ecclesia meant to gather together. The church is a concept, it's a gathering together. And isn't that what we say too? Some of us send our children to a Christian school. But we say to our kids, even if we send them to a Christian school, be sure to make friends with good children. Don't be the naughty one of the class. What we do is we gather that class together and we try to get those people to be like-minded and so right from the very beginning of our lives, whether it's in Sunday school or church or somewhere else, we're looking for that like-mindedness. And then your kids get older, and you say, wow, they're starting to date. Oh, boy, this, 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 could, this could be tough. And so then we take out that verse out of 1 Corinthians and we say, don't be unequally yoked unbelievers. That is, take a like-minded person. So you send big bucks and send them to a Christian college. And you hope that they meet a nice Christian boy or girl. And that they can come and you can spend more big bucks for a nice wedding because it's like-minded. And we look forward to always having like-minded people around us. That's why we may join a political party or a cause like a pro-life group or uh, some other kind of group. And so always we're looking for that gathering of like-minded people. And that's why Paul wrote to Timothy twice, Timothy, keep at it. Well, we ought to look at the next one influence others. Yes, we've just seen that like-minded people can influence together. They're a group that has a, small, a great opportunity to influence other people. In our culture, we have things like Susan G. Komen. Who was she? You know? I don't know, except she was somebody who died of cancer. But how many millions of people died of cancer? But her family said, we're not gonna let Susan's life be for nothing, and we're not gonna let her name just die out. We're gonna gather like-minded people and we're gonna get the Susan, Susan G. Komen Foundation together. And maybe some of you have walked for that, raising money for cancer research and for a cancer society, and to help those who are going through the expensive uh, problems that come with cancer. You see, one person can make a difference, and that person can be remembered. And if the people who are like-minded get together behind that person, they can make a tremendous difference. We do the same thing when we talk about Megan's Law of Child Abuse or the Amber Alert that we get on our phone when some child is 
taken and we don't know why or by whom. These are people who are like-minded and they are examples of how we can be that way in our culture. Boys and girls, how many grades of school did Peter, James, and John have? Probably zero. Because their father Zebedee said, guys, we got to get the fish. And so they grew up. The Bible even calls them uneducated men. And look how those men changed the world. God gave them the gumption to really change the culture in which they lived. And that first Sunday, 5,000 people came to know Jesus. Tremendous what was done because one person stood up, one Timothy in the city of Ephesus. We can make a difference. And that's exactly why Paul wrote to Timothy right here in verse 14 of this chapter, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. That is, Timothy, you know the stuff. Timothy, you've got the courage. Timothy, you've got the power of the Holy Spirit. You can do it. And there's one more. Number one, pray. Everything depends on prayer. Oh, I know. We sometimes discount it. We say, does God really hear prayer? Does God really answer prayer? Well, we saw examples of God answering prayer in our morning prayer. And we're going to see examples of God answering our prayer as our young people come and make profession of faith. Of course we see answers to prayer. It's a powerful thing. Prayer changes things. And prayer sometimes even changes God. I'm sure you teenagers have heard about and learned about good King Hezekiah in the Old Testament. And God says to a prophet, you've got to go to Hezekiah and tell him he's going to die. He's been king for a lot of years, done a good job. I'm really pleased, but it's time to take him to heaven. So the prophet goes and tells Hezekiah, Hezekiah, you're going to die. Well, Hezekiah doesn't want to die. He says, well, I have been a good king. I've done all the things God wants me to do. Why should I die? So he gets in his bed, and he lies there. And he puts his face right against the wall. And with tears streaming down his cheeks, he cries out to God. He says, God, I don't want to die. I want to continue to rule for you. Help me be a good king. God says, well, okay, to the prophet, why don't you go back and tell Hezekiah he's going to live? So he did. And then, boys and girls, you probably remember what happened. He asked for extra life, but he wasn't as good a king as he was before that experience. And so sadly, he went down, and that happens to us too when we pray. We'll pray for something, and God will give it to us. And then we misuse it. So prayer is a powerful tool. And prayer is really important. Some of you who are I mean, old enough to remember Ronald Reagan appointing Dr. C. Everett Koop as the Surgeon General of the United States. He was the first person that I ever saw that took the job of Surgeon General super seriously. He was a tall man with a real presence, and he always wore the special uniform of the Surgeon General of the United States. He was a very conservative Presbyterian, 
And so he was part of a very small Presbyterian denomination. Has only a few churches in the United States. And while he was Surgeon General, he was traveling all over in city after city talking about what we need to do to be a healthy country. And they tell me that he always traveled with the Christian Reformed Yearbook. Because when he'd be in a city on Sunday, he'd look, hmm, is there a Christian Reformed Church there? Oh, yes, yeah, sure enough. And he'd show up in his uniform. And wow, was that impressive. People used to just, their friends being in church, and all of a sudden, somebody in his big military uniform comes marching down the aisle, sits in the front, tall, posing figure. Some of my colleagues have told me about that experience. I came out of the council room, went to the pulpit, and there was Dr. C. Everett Koop sitting toward the front with that big uniform. Wow, what an impression. But you know what C. Everett Koop said? I'm too busy to pray, so I have others pray for me. In my duties as Surgeon General, I'm just going all over the place. I don't have time to pray. I think he speaks for a lot of us who think that we are too busy to pray. And so we're losing out on having some of the ammunition that we need to fight off the devil. We haven't taken time to really sit down and reflect on what Jesus wants us to think about. And so we're losing the ability to be strong in the Lord. We have a tendency to be doers, not prayers. But probably some of our best prayers are people who are in listening in the rest homes today or listening in retirement homes. They have the time to pray. And I've had countless of them say to me, why does it God take me home? I'm ready to go to heaven now. And I said, because we need your prayers in our church. We need your prayers for our country. Prayer is the only thing that can turn us around. Well, here we've gone through correction. We need to be where to act. We have to learn God's word. We have to gather like-minded people, influence others. We've got to pray. And the question comes, does it work today? Or is this just something that is historical? It was okay for Paul and okay for Timothy and maybe okay for Ephesus. But what about Sioux Falls? What about our lives? Well, that's what Paul Den Hagen did, didn't he? He was a businessman in our community. And he says, this is what our city needs. And he kept studying his Bible and seeing how he could correct, take the word of God and help, it, help our city be the kind of city that we'd want it to be. He gathered like-minded people together. People said, yeah, Paul, we'll be your campaign committee. We'll see that you can be promoted to mayor. Then what did he do? He influenced others enough so that they voted for him so that now he's our mayor. He's done the whole thing praying that he would be a powerful witness for Christ in the city of Sioux Falls. Now you can say, well, Paul Hagen, he has special gifts. Well, maybe he does. But you're just as special as, God is, as he is to God. And you have the same Holy Spirit. And you have the same talents. Differ ones, but God wouldn't have you here if he didn't expect you to be doing something for his kingdom. And so we're living in a community, in a city, in a culture, in a state where you and I can make a real difference by simply 
praying seriously, influencing others, gathering like-minded people, learning God's word, being aware to act, and we can make a difference. And we make a difference. And we will make a difference if all we do is follow those steps out of 2 Timothy 3. But now some of you teenagers are pretty smart. And you say, you know what? There's two parts to that verse. We saw verse A first, but now what's verse B? There will be terrible times in the last days. Uh Uh-oh. What if we are coming into those last days? The days described here in the first part of the chapter. What if we're almost up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? What if God has decided that after he blessed the United States of America, it's time to punish us? And he'd sure have enough reason to punish us, wouldn't he? And we'd have to take it because we deserve it as a country. So, yeah. Maybe even when we do our best, we still can't turn things around. Because after all, Christ said, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. And what are the last two verses of the Bible? You teenagers remember those? Well, let's put them on the screen. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with God's people. Amen. Jesus is coming. The time is coming, and we're doing everything we can to train our children so they can stand strong as soldiers of the cross, boys and girls, men and women, for the Lord Jesus Christ, making a tremendous difference. We need the courage to stand, to know that God could in his providence overrule our best efforts. But he still asks us to be the salt and the light and the leaven of this world. That became especially apparent to me when I was teaching in Nigeria. I've taught courses in seminaries in the United States of America. I've taught at seminary in Mexico. And then I taught in Nigeria. And that's a whole different game. Because you see, Nigeria is divided half Christian, half Muslim. And the experts in foreign affairs tell us that the way Nigeria goes is the way Africa goes. Africa could be a tremendously powerful Christian continent or it could be a Muslim continent, also terrible and treacherous. And so I sat and stood in front of a classroom. Some of my classes are 24, 40, 72 was my biggest class. And 175 men. And what were they training to be? Pastors, what happens if the Muslims come into your community? Who is the first person that they capture? It's the pastor. Because they know that if they're in a Christian village, the pastor has been the outstanding spokesman for the gospel. 
The pastor has been saying Islam is incorrect. The pastor has been the driving force. And so what is their choice of preference? It's to capture the pastor, tie him up to a tree, rape his wife in front of his eyes, kill all of his children, then gouge out his eyes, and then chop off his head. And they sit in that classroom knowing that I could go out to this village or that village or that village, and the Muslims would come, and my family would be put through that, and I would see that, and that would be my life. Now, that takes a lot of courage to sit and learn from God's Word using the very same Bible that we use right here in this church, with the very same kind of convictions about Jesus Christ. But theirs can be put to the test, and those 175 students are sitting there saying, I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the courage to go to seminary I have the courage to go out and be a pastor. I have the courage to give my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of courage we need today. It takes a lot of courage to stand against our culture. It takes a lot of courage to say this is the inerrant, infallible, trustworthy, authoritative Word of God. It takes a lot of courage in our culture to stand for Jesus Christ. It takes a lot of courage for us to look up at the cross every single Sunday and know that the cross of Jesus Christ was where he gave his life so that we might give our lives too and might have to. After all, right here we read that every person who follows Christ may be persecuted. And we have a marvelous example in our community. It wasn't easy for Paul Ten Haken to become mayor. It's not always easy for him to be mayor. But he has the courage to have looked at what our city needs, try to meet those needs, to influence others to be supportive, to pray until God's will is done. Father in heaven, may our Holy Spirit give us the courage we need to really live for you, not just in a general way, but deep down convictions about Christ and the cross and what it means to really be born again, born so that we can be people who share eternal life. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the courageous Christians around the world who are being persecuted. And we pray for the persecuted church. And we pray that Africa will become a Christian continent. And Father, hear and answer our prayers, making us your courageous people, infused by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Christ of the cross, all for your glory, glory and in your grace. Amen. Let's rise to receive God's blessing to us. And this blessing comes to us today out of Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. And we praise God with our closing song. Christ is my